That one has. Sorry. No worries. Uh, many times you may not have symptoms because unfortunately people with Parkinson's tend to go to the bathroom a lot anyway because their bladder doesn't expand enough and your bladder um, tells you you need to go a lot anyway. So, so if you're not having pain or fever or anything, you may not even realize you have one. Um, it could be a mild respiratory infection. I just had a patient in the last couple of weeks suddenly became, uh, started having symptoms and we were scratching our head and then they turned out positive for COVID two days later. So any kind of infection, uh, even in the early stages where the body's trying to, uh, to fight that infection off, it makes your system weaker and uh, it makes you more prone to, to having this. Um, medications, so uh, medications would be the next thing I look at. What's, what's changed? Uh, it's, it gets harder and harder to, to keep track of everybody's medicines because typically you're going to more than just one doctor and our systems unfortunately do not talk well to each other. So that's usually the, the uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, of the day is figuring out what actual medicines my folks are taking. And, and if there's been a new medication, let's say they increased your Parkinson's medicine or we started a new Parkinson's medicine or you're not sleeping, so you got started on a new sleep medicine or you know any of anything that any medication that could potentially uh, affect the brain can can trigger a change in those neurochemicals enough to to start having some of these symptoms. Um, there's other medication, you know there's you know, I'd say any medicine can do anything, but there are certain other types of medications, certain antibiotics, some other things like that that can do it, uh, that can do it as well. So, so that's the sleuth thing. What's changed? What's new? Is there a potential infection? Have we changed medications lately? Um, changing environment. Did you go on a vacation to an unusual, you know, a place you hadn't been to, or um, as you know, as disease progresses, um, typically wor your world does get smaller because uh, any kind of change to the routine can kind of throw throw off sleep habits. It can throw off um, uh, the brain just trying to stay oriented. It gets harder to to keep yourself oriented to where you're off, where you're at, and then that triggers. You know, anytime think about the last time you were lost. I mean, obviously there's anxiety when you're lost. Where am I? How do I get back? And so if you're in that more chronically, more persistently, that's gonna also increase um, your chances of, of just throwing the balance off. Um, so then the other, kind of the other piece is they do find that uh, folks that have these symptoms, um, more of them have cognitive impairment than those that don't. Um, so that's a fancy term for memory loss or loss of being able to problem solve. Um, that orientation I talked about, it gets harder to know where am I, how do I get from point A to point B? Um, so the, these are kind of the early stages of dementia that can also develop uh, with Parkinson's, but having hallucinations or these delusions can definitely be kind of a sign of having some, some cognitive impairment underlying. And so that's, you know, that's where that need to maybe stick to the routine, stick to the places you know, stick to those um patterns uh helps folks stay oriented where they're not having the anxiety as much and not triggering uh, some of these hallucinations as much if anybody has questions as i go through this i'm more than happy to be interrupted i know i'm monotone so you can you can help out but uh i'll let you manage the online hands 
So thanks, Michelle. Uh, I mentioned medicine. So not only medicines, so medications, all the Parkinson's medications that you take to treat symptoms and treat your disease, unfortunately, on the other side of that can trigger hallucination. So an increase in dose, for example, may trigger them. Um, there's certain medications that can do it more likely than others. Um, and so we look at those. Amantadine is a common one that we really start slowly on because of that risk. Um, your dopamine agonists, um, so like Requip or Ropinerol or Mirapex, uh, Pramipexol was the other, is the other name. I think Nupro is one. All of those, that class of medications we know um, has a higher risk of causing hallucinations than like your Cinemet or your Carbidopa, Weedopa. Um, so it's always a balancing act of can we decrease the medicine? Is this medicine still effective? Could we potentially, um, you know, stop the artane, uh, which may be more likely to cause hallucinations and maybe isn't as effective? So it's it's a balancing act of do we decrease medicine or do we have to start new medicine to try to treat these uh, to treat these symptoms? So. So once we kind of go through all this, you know, all this assessment, is it infection, is it medication, is it multiple medications, we need to decrease. Then we start looking at, okay, um, what do we have to treat? What do we have to treat these? Um, so there's, there's, it's not very good data. There's some anecdotal data that actually some of the medicines we prescribe for dementia can help uh, decrease your uh, chances of hallucination. So Aricept uh, or Donibazil is that class of drugs. There's a couple others, Exelon, Galantamine, those are all in the same family. Um, you know, I, going to the Parkinson's uh, classes over the years and talking with the, you know, a lot of them feel like actually in Parkinson's, those medicines might even work better for folks than in uh, Alzheimer's or some of, or other types of, of dementia. So no, no concrete data, but, but that could definitely be something that could help decrease uh, the risk. Once you have them, it doesn't necessarily treat them. It just helps decrease the chances of you having them. There's, there's one. Um, so beyond that, there's there's a few other uh, medications we can we typically look at. One is actually a seizure medicine. I've uh, used some, uh, but it's also used for some mood uh, stability and, and helping kind of balance some of these neurochemicals. Uh, it's called Depakote, um, but we use it at a, much, a very low dose, and um, it tends to have fewer side effects than the, than the antipsychotic class of medicine, so that's usually worth a try in ways just to see if, if people get results from that. Um, beyond that, then we're usually looking at medicines that are actually um, in the antipsychotic family. Um, so we're basically trying to treat those neurochemical abnormalities that are contributing to the hallucinations. The problem is, is a lot of these drugs um, block dopamine. So you can imagine the, the concern for taking dopamine to help with my tremor or my movement, uh, but now I need to take a drug that actually blocks dopamine. Um, so there's one in particular called Seroquel or quetiapine uh, that's been around a long time. And it, it does block dopamine some, but not as much as the others. So that's really the only one that's been around for a long time anyway. The only one we, we really would look to, to use. And typically it's a very low dose. So to treat like a true, um, uh, like a patient with schizophrenia or somebody with 
you know, true primary mental health disorder is more than hundreds of milligrams, 300 or more milligrams of Seroquel um, to treat those folks. Um, we, we typically start at a, like 12.5 milligrams, so like half of the lowest dose, people complain that they have to cut it. Um, so just to give you a, you know, an idea of, you know, we're not treating, you know, you don't have schizophrenia, you don't have, um, you're not going crazy, you don't have, um, you know, severe mental health problem when you have hallucinations is truly a neurochemical imbalance caused by Parkinson's. Um, there's a newer um, there's a newer one out. I honestly haven't used it a whole a whole lot. Uh, new placid is the blank brand name. Uh, Pema Banserin is the uh, generic name, but it works a little bit differently than uh, than quetiapine. Um, it, it carries, you know, you look at the risk of both drugs and it's very similar. There really hasn't been a head-to-head -head, um, comparison on one over the other, but, but the idea is the same as trying a low dose um, to try to keep these neurochemicals in balance. So, um, so those are the kind of the, the treatment options. Um, things that folks can do. So sleep is always a problem uh, for, for, uh, for people with Parkinson's. Uh, but I do find that people, if we can figure out a regimen that helps people sleep on a consistent basis, it definitely decreases um, the hallucinations uh, over time or, or it delays them. Um, so that's, that's a big one we look at. Um, you know, trying to be as active as possible, trying to get outside, you know, when it's not zero degrees outside, obviously, but uh, but just that sunlight, helping to stay oriented to when it's day and when it's night, uh, all those kinds of things can help, uh, help decrease those risks, so. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that covers my main things. Um, so probably the big thing to take away is, you know, at least up to a half of people with Parkinson's will have these symptoms. Um, if they are treatable, many times you can figure out a, a potential trigger for them as well. And so um, it's helpful to, to talk to your healthcare provider. I know, uh, they may seem, maybe some some folks may feel like it's something they need to keep to themselves or don't want to share, but um, but there's definitely good good treatment, good options, um, and and potentially it's actually decreasing medicine. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> so um, so anyway, what questions do you all have, Victor? Can you decrease uh, you decrease one medicine in place of the other. Like increase? No. One decrease? Yeah. And then increase another one? Yeah. So the question is do you decrease one and then increase another in its place? Um I mean, it's hard to kind of speak to specific instances, but typically we would do one change at a time. I mean, I would recommend one change at a time, typically with your with your provider. So, you know, first it's well, let's let's decrease things and then see how things go, and then we'll we'll kind of reassess at that time. Um, you know, maybe we could put you on one of these uh, like Aricept or something so you could actually tolerate a higher dose or, you know, so there's different things to, to consider uh, with each, with each uh, patient. Yeah. Dr. Lowe, you know, that sentence you were just speaking about, 
Um, how long would you anticipate waiting to see the effect of an increase in the you know, drug before starting uh, something else? Uh, it's pretty variable, um, but at least a week probably. I wouldn't do any real drastic changes real quick. Um, so at least a week, usually longer, just to let things kind of wash out, settle out. Yeah. <clears throat> Is this like Lewy bodies form in the brain that happens in the age and that can cause the dementia of the hallucinations? Well, the question is the, the Lewy bodies and what their role is uh, in this, I would say. So, um, Lewy bodies are what's found in the brain. We don't know what causes them. Um, yes, but um, but they've done studies looking at brains after the fact, right? And and there's definitely a correlation with folks that that have suffered from hallucinations and delusions have a higher overall number in general, but not always. But just more more often than not, uh, there's more Lewy bodies in the in that population of people. Um, there's also some studies showing where the Lewy bodies are at may play a role. So, you know, the, uh, the uh, well, think of your brain as an orange. The peel is where we do all our high, you know, that's what makes us human to some people. That's what, that's not what makes us problem solve and think through things and, and all that. Well, we're not just, you know, we, we risk and reward, you know, just all that, the higher thinking. Um, so if you have more of the Lewy bodies in that peel, in that part of your brain, um, then tends to have more dementia, more memory loss than those where it's deeper into the brain. Um, those are just kind of generalizations. It's not an absolute, but yeah. Everybody with yeah, that's that's kind of the pathologic definition. Yeah. Oh, does everybody with Parkinson's have Lewy bodies? And yes, that, that's what the officially defines Parkinson's. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you explain what Lewy bodies are? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me to go way back into my brain, um, but we don't know what we don't know what causes them um, for sure. Um, but we know it's what contributes to the dopamine loss um, in the brain. So I don't know if anybody knows for sure what exactly causes it, and um, but no, I can't sit here and pretend to know. That pathology way back. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I think Janet had it. Well, I have the same question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Let's do the online. Was there an online? Did yeah, you sure. So, um, is having vivid dreams considered a hallucination? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, Sleep disorders are very common in uh, in Parkinson's, and and it, I would I probably put it in a it's a matter of um, I just lost the word, but uh, it's it's probably contributing. So what causes the vivid dreams is probably probably also contributing to the hallucinations. It's just a matter of as a matter of severity. I would say it's all on the same continuum. That's the word continuum. But um, so REM sleep disorder. So it's not. It's fairly common in that uh, I'll have spouses talk to me about um, 
their loved one that had they'll act out in their sleep, they'll talk in their sleep. Um, people with Parkinson's wake up in a in a frantic panic because their dreams are so real. And um, that's not technically uh, hallucinations because it's it's classic for just overnight versus during the day when you're awake. Um, so REM, so our REM sleep, that's when we dream, that's when we're active. Um, that's called, so we can have what's called a REM sleep disorder. And so there's different medications that can be used to help treat that. But sometimes when they're severe, um, we do consider the same type of treatment, like a low dose um, of one of those medications. So, um, those typically happen uh, much more commonly than, than hallucinations, and we do have medication that those tend to respond to fairly, fairly well. Yeah. Sure. Do, all, do people who do not suffer with Parkinson's have Lewy body uh, elements in their brain? I mean, if they're does everybody have a new body development in the brain, whether they're in Parkinson's or not? Uh, so the question is, is does everybody have Lewy bodies, um, whether you have Parkinson's or not? I, would, I mean, the general answer is no. Um, but there's no absolutes in medicine. So I'm sure there's been studies done of quote unquote normal brains after uh, death, obviously. And there's probably a segment of folks that have some Lewy bodies uh, that were never, you know, clinically found to have Parkinson's or dementia. So, uh, but in general, no, they're not a normal part of aging or anything like that. Jump in real quick, Dr. Yeah. Matt. Let me borrow this for a second. Okay, so we're going to go with the um, definition here for the best description of Lewy bodies. Clumps of proteins that build up inside certain neurons or brain cells. So they cause damage to neurons in the areas of your brain of your brain that affect mental capabilities, behavior, movement, and sleep. So that's a pretty good description of it. So when you think about like in Alzheimer's, they talk about plaques and tangles, right? Those are extra things in your brains that start to develop that interfere with the connections that your brain makes to, to remember. So Lewy bodies would be more of they're attacking, attacking other cells. These other proteins are attacking the cells that affect your cognition, your movements. That help? Good old Google. Yeah. What do you prescribe for acting out your dreams? When you have a patient come in and say, you know, I punched my wife in the nose or actually got up and did something crazy. Is this part of the Parkinson's symptom? Or 20 years ago, I had a doctor tell me, if you're acting out your dreams, you're probably going to end up with Parkinson's. So he told me, and he was right. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to give you a drug name per se, but I mean, there's. Well, I don't know. So there's. What? My husband, you know, that was such a big deal. Yeah. Isn't that the cell? Does that help reduce? Yeah, that's the. One of those memory pills we talked about that try to decrease that the hallucinations and help with memory essentially. Um, clonazepam is one that that is prescribed uh, for that, and obviously there's risk factors and potential side effects. But um, so yeah, um, there have been some studies to say if you. You know, if you suffer from very vivid dreams in midlife, um, the other one is smell. You lose your um, sense of smell early. That can be one of the very first signs. Um, but 
Yeah. Well, I, I'm just curious because uh, 20 years ago, I thought he was crazy when he said Parkinson's. I was in no idea what Parkinson's really was all about. They've done a lot of studies, and I just thought maybe you might have some kind of like prescription or uh, medication that you would, if I came into your office and say, well, did you call it? You're on it. <laughs> yeah. Is there something yeah. stronger? <laughs> There's always some stronger. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, that's where you kind of debate what's, you know, is it worth telling somebody something or not when there's really nothing right now that it benefits you to know that you're going to have it when you're 40 versus letting, letting things happen. But, you know, have, you ever, have you ever told one of your patients, uh, you've been having dreams and you're acting them out, you're going to get Parkinson's? No. <laughs> Until I have a drug that would get that person to not get Parkinson's or to delay getting Parkinson's, I don't see a reason to. Well, I think he was just trying to alert me. Yeah, a 20 year alert. <laughs> so. Right, like I completely agree with Dr. Matt. Like he may have known that and good for him, but at the same time, what does that do for you? Like we don't have the cure, we don't have a, a something that other than telling people to exercise, right? Other than telling people to exercise, eat well, sleep well, to be told that, that's that's a little freaky. So I think just all of us need to work on exercise, eat well, sleep well, engage with other people, right? So I have to say, I'm kind of sorry that that happened to you, John. Well, that's that's kind of true. The reason I say it. So, you know, it's, it's hard to think that you know when you're 35, 40 years old, they're going to tell you you're going to have Parkinson's. And I ended up with Parkinson's. And I, I was just wondering how many patients, percentage wise, you said 30, 40 percent come to you and have some kind of hallucination or uh, Parkinson's symptom. Does that make sense? Do you understand my question? No. Well, 30 or and 30 to 50 percent of people with Parkinson's, diagnosed Parkinson's, have hallucinations, not not of uh, people coming to me. It's those that have already been diagnosed. Well, what is a hallucination? You know, I can look on the ground and see a stick and it looks like it has legs moving, you know, like a spider. Is that a hallucination? Yeah. Must have stick out of lights. I just so so there's mild ones, right? I mean, that's partly as our vision goes. Um, you know, your eyes don't dilate and you can shrink quite as well with Parkinson's. So um, you know, those we just probably don't even think about. We just keep on, keep it on. But if they get more severe or they're affecting life, that um, that's when we really need to start looking into treating. Well, I was uh, with my family, and we were in a motel, and I started screaming, You're out! You're out! You're out! You're safe! Woke up my whole family. Well, I was wondering, you know, what in the world am I living in a heaven? Not a disorder of REM sleep? Yeah, that's that REM sleep disorder. Okay, no, I've, I've asked enough. I just no, out here. Good to have a conversation, right? I appreciate your openness. Can you share a little bit about like what's happening in the brain during the REM sleep disorder? Like uh, just 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 simplistically, like what's happening? You're dreaming. So but something triggers in REM sleep disorder where you actually start acting it out um, and it gets more something starting to cross the dreaming reality spectrum and so that's 
you may have always dreamed these things, but now you're just starting to, to act them out a little bit more. Have you ever had a patient come up to you and say they sleep more? Yeah. That bother you? I mean, sure. <laughs> sure it does. Yes, yeah, so I have people come up, ask me, if that, or tell me that they sleepwalk, and they, yes, we do. We um, high risk of falls um, for sure uh, with, with that. Because you're always cautious about treating it because then they're more groggy and they're more off balance. And so it, it really is a, a back and forth decision on that. Uh, um, the, uh, I have a combination of all of those that we're talking about, except uh, I, uh, I don't listen exclusively uh, not much, but uh, I have a, a thing now that I never ever did before, and I was like, uh, I'll have dreams. I never had dreams before. I uh, talk in my well, not really in my sleep, but I'll be sitting in my chair listening to the television and answer the questions or put something you know that they're talking about. And uh, uh, the other night, I thought my wife was hollering at me, you know, and I got up and walked all around the apartment and she, I couldn't find her and went back. She was still in bed, you know. So, but I had a, I have a combination of practically all of it. So, uh, things that you're talking about. Yeah. I think it's all on a spectrum, honestly. I mean, rather than looking at these like this is REM sleep, this is hallucinations, this is delusions. I mean, it's, I think it's all in the same family of things and it can pop up different ways at different times. Um, so just trying to manage that as best we can with the different medicine. Um, but as you can, yeah. Unfortunately, the me, you know the medicines to help you walk and get around can actually contribute to some of that uh, as well. So. I, mean, I also have dreams, dreams that I never. Well, I mean, I have certain times, but now I get blurred with dreams, you know. But I never have yet I've got up and acted out again. Yeah. Except the other night when I was with a mom. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the only chance she has of getting rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a two-part question. Uh, my late husband was diagnosed at Mayo's with multiple systems atrophy. And my question is, is that really an advanced Parkinson's or is it a disease all on its own? And the second part is, is it inherited by our children, the multiple system of atrophy? Can you explain that? I'll try. So the question is multi system atrophy. So there's several um, diseases that kind of act like Parkinson's, but they're actually their own separate um, condition and different pathology. And so I would say MSA or multi-system atrophy is not just a progression of Parkinson's, it's its own illness. Um, it's just that there's a lot of crossover uh, between the two. And so, um, and no, it's not, uh, there's not a strong risk of heredity um to pass that down. Um, I would uh, it's far more common, far, far more common to be random to be um be idiopathic. The young onset, like super young, 30s, 40s, that's that can be more common for sure, uh, because they're linking that to some genetic things. But but your typical Parkinson's that you get after, you know age 60 is not generally thought to have a strong uh, heredity component. Yeah. 
Five parentheses of God on um, Agent um, Orange is um, getting on in the from Zion. And that you pass on to my children or my grandchildren. Uh, we haven't seen that no. uh, so far. It's only affected um, the men and women are, you know, directly exposed, but not um, not their offspring. Yes, sir. I have um, two grandfathers that had um, Parkinson's. My dad had Parkinson's. I had Parkinson's. Three of the brothers had Parkinson's. Wait, wait, that one. You're, uh, all I can say is you're one of the, the few that are likely. You know, there's, there's either a, a, a gene mutation or a change. Uh, in our genetic makeup that we haven't found yet, or um, I don't know all the, I haven't been looking at all that data, but obviously there's some that are, and I'm not saying none of them are, but uh, if your your situation sounds like you're one that that does have a familial uh, pattern to it. So if I, the more you get into medicine, and the more you get into things, what seemed to be black and white becomes very gray. And I think that's the case uh, with Parkinson's for sure. It's not just a hand tremor and maybe some difficulty walking. It's, um, and it's not just over 65, right? It's, it's, it can be younger. So there's just no, there's no absolutes for sure. I would also say I would encourage people to look into the genetics testing. So, for example, um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has genetic testing that can be done, and they're using that to, to research more. Um, the Parkinson's Foundation has the PD generation. Um, they will send you, you just sign up, they will send you the information and the kit. And I believe it's the one where you just, you either spit or you swap your cheek. Um, and then they'll get the results. But, you know, especially someone who has that familial traits or characteristic, I think, you know, those individuals especially, but everyone um, can, can really help out the future of research um, by, by being tested. So, and you don't have to have the results. So maybe you just want to participate to help the, the future generations but you don't want to know the results or your kids or your grandkids don't want to know the results. Cause that's a, that's a tough thing. It's kind of like what we were talking about with John, you know, do, do you want to know that I have a higher likelihood of getting this disease in 20 years? What's that? It's very scary. Yeah. It's very scary. So you can ask to not have your information shared with you if you choose to participate in the research. Okay. Yeah. Uh, part of the uh, pain med center, to Dr. Al, um, they came out and asked me if I wanted to be tested mm -hmm. because I also served my father. Mm -hmm. So they tested me, but they they didn't think that there was any connection. Yeah. Other than genetic, uh, is there any connection like with the use of? Insect repellents and, and that type of thing that causes Parkinson's. I think there was some talk of that way back sometime. Yeah. I, I'm not aware of anything um, from a, like what we put like off or what we put on our bodies. Like there hasn't been any clear cut association with that. But at high doses, Farmers that have used insecticides for years, Agent Orange, those sorts of things, there's definitely um, an increased risk and connection. So, teachers, whatever reason, teachers put you at a higher risk for Parkinson's, isn't that weird? But uh, it's probably dealing with children all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know. Maybe I have too many. Yes, um, a question that I get asked working with the care partners is, you know, how to respond when your loved one's having a really vivid hallucination. Um, are there, you know, responses that are more helpful or things to help them relate to the physician? Um, so I would say in the, in the, somebody's due for their medicine on that. Yes. <laughs> Good job. Um, so in the moment, I would say it's probably not helpful to tell them that's not happening or, uh, depends on the severity, right? So if there's some, if they have some understanding that they're having these and they know that they're not real, it's probably reasonable to say, yeah, I'm not seeing that, it's, it's your Parkinson's. Um, but if it's one of the more severe uh, episodes and there's just no redirection, um, trying to redirect them to something else rather than saying, you know, that's not there, you're not seeing it, really trying to point their direction to something turn their attention to something else as best you can because um, it will pass. Uh, if you can just get the brain to, to stop focusing on that thing, it, it can pass. So if you have to kind of go with, with it, if it's not harmful and, and you just kind of go with it, you go with it for a little while and then you just try to continue the conversation in another direction. Um, I find that's, that's been the best uh, approach. Um, yeah. Do I need to wake him or let him get go ahead and go I would, I, I would just let him be. So it, it's kind of like a person that has a seizure. You want to try to protect their head. You know, want to make sure they're not in harm's way. But um, you can start them pretty bad sometimes if you interrupt, essentially. But I don't want you getting punched either. You, you, know, you can get out of it. <laughs> right. Other question was if someone's having a REM sleep disorder episode where they're acting out, um, is it in general, I would say, is it good to wake them or not? I would say not, unless they're in harm's way of some kind. Uh, they're sleepwalking, you know, or, um, you know, if you can try to coax, sometimes you can just kind of coax them right back to bed and they, and then get back in bed and go back to sleep. So, um, so trying to do it without like startling them, and, and sometimes they'll wake up on their own, uh, but that doesn't tend to cause the same distress. Well, what's the difference between delusion and hallucination and delusion? And delusions. So hallucination is something you might experience with your senses that's not there. So you see something, you hear something, you smell something, you hear something, maybe even taste, I suppose, um, that isn't actually present, that your brain is saying is present. Delusion is more in your like thoughts. So thinking abnormal thoughts that aren't true. Um, you know, my wife's cheating on me, or, you know, I don't know, money is often involved, you know, thinking people are stealing from you, or, um, you know, somebody's harming you in some way. Uh, those are more delusional thoughts. So when a patient comes to see you and starts describing these events at night, can you determine whether or not they're having delusions or? Basically, hallucinations. It would be more during the day. I mean, the, the dreams, the vivid dreams and the REM sleep, you know, is, you know, that's treated a little bit differently. But if it's during the day, I mean, treatment's essentially the same. Um, delusions tend to be a little bit harder for, um, for folks to have insight into and to really be able to have that conversation because um, it's so real. 
and it's just so real. This box is just so real. Um, so I try to, you know, frame it in. Well, let's try sleep medicine, right? Or you know, those sorts of things to try to um, get them to try things. So. All right. Yeah. Well, All right. Well, I appreciate y'all having me, and uh, that's right. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one other thing I want to add to that too is that if someone is having more of the hallucinations, where they you know like think that they see something in the corner, or that they think that there's something on the floor, check out the lighting in your space. Um, because oftentimes there will be shadows that can trigger some of the hallucinations. And if you just turn on the lights or you give more lighting in darker places, that can help. Um, so it, it could be that there's just not enough distinction between shadows um, that that that's a really easy way to to help get rid of some of those. I'm not saying it can happen like that all the time, but sometimes, it can be as easy as just turning on more lights or changing the spaces that you have, things in your space. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, awesome. All right, well, I have a couple things of business for you all. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording here.